Hi, welcome to section three on debugging and testing in Julia. So we're going to cover a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, in this first video, we're going to look at different approaches for debugging in Julia. And in the next video, we're going to look at how you could structure or write your code so it's more easy to debug and test it. And then finally, we're going to look at some ways that you can write better tests and test your code. So first, let's look at how we can do debugging in Julia. The simplest and most straightforward way uh, that you can do in pretty much any programming language in any environment, no matter how primitive, is a kind of printf and logging based debugging. So that's when you don't have any kind of debugger. And this is very common for statically typed languages. However, for a dynamic language like Julia, it's also an opportunity you can do quite a lot of in the REPL environments, trying out things that allows you to sort of simulate a debugging process. But of course, Julia does in fact have a debugger or actually has a couple um, that we can use. They're not as fancy as a, maybe the debuggers that you're probably used to from languages like Java or, or C Sharp. So first, let's look at some printf based debugging. So basically, the idea is that you output to the console or to a file for that matter, um, the state of your program at strategic location. So places in your code that's going to help you understand what's going on. And the example I'm going to give you here is from bubble sword. Now we're not actually going to be hunting for some bug in the bubble store algorithm, but I'm just going to show you how you would go about going through the bubble sort and seeing what's going on inside the bubble sort to figure out a potential problem. So if you don't know what bubble sort is like, basically you have some array, let's say excess in this case, and we're iterating over this array multiple times. So we have an index i and i plus one, and this gives us two numbers we're always comparing. So we're comparing the six and the five and seeing if the six is larger than five. And if it is, so we have to do a swap. And if it's larger than uh, four, we have to do a swap. And so it just continues like this up to n minus one, because of course, if we went beyond that, then i plus one would go out of bounds. So the reason it's called bubble up is that when we're doing this comparison, you will see that um, now we're comparing six to four and because it's larger, it's going to take its place. And so it's going to look like the six is bubbling up. And then because we did this swap, we have to go through the array again and we're going to start at the beginning. And now we're comparing the five to the four because five was larger than four. It has to move up. We have to swap them. And so this swapping keeps going until the five is moved up. And of course, five is less than six, so this doesn't continue further. And then uh, we're going to start over again at the beginning with four, and that keeps bubbling up. So this will keep on going until the array is sorted. So this is the code that we can use for doing a bubble sort in Julia. We start by marking a flag called swap that indicates whether we actually had to swap two numbers. Uh, I'm going to start by saying it true, not because we really know anything about swapping at this point, but just because we don't want an early exit from the while loop here, which is checking whether a swapping happened. Because once there has been no swapping going on, uh, we know that we went through without any element being in the wrong order. So we know it's sorted. We're going to start off assuming that there was, in fact, no swapping until we're proven otherwise. So as we're going through the for loop, we're checking if the ith element of xs is larger than the uh, the preceding or the next element. And if there are, we have the swap, and then we're going to mark that off in the swapped flag. So that's going to cause us to keep on going in, in the while loop. And finally, I like to return the data that I'm working on. So I'm returning xs here. I'm doing that even though bubble sort in this case is a mutating function and I mark that off with the exclamation mark. You should always do that. It makes it easier to reason about your code and you should make a non-muting 
mutating version, which is what I do here. So I'm copying excess to make sure that we're not altering the uh, the argument. This is the non-mutating versions or the pure versions are easier to work with in the REPL because you don't have to reinitialize your data over and over again because they get changed. So let's uh, test our bubble sort. We've got an array in uh, descending order and one in ascending. So the bubble sort gives us that. And we got some random data in YS. And once we put that into bubble sort, it puts it in the right order. So to do our sort of printf, our logging based debugging, we want some function that allows us to output something like this. And I typically like to have some marker like in big letters that says something about what this line is for. So it's easy to search for. For instance, if you're logging to a, a text file. And we want to be able to turn on and off things. So to turn off debugging, we just said debugging false. And then whenever we write the debug uh, with some message, it's not going to show up. So how do we implement a functionality like this? Well, this is super simple to do. Uh, we just have a variable that we set to true or false, and we're checking for that inside the debug function. But what's really cool in Julia is that you can have a macro, a debug macro. Now, why would you want to have that? Why not just use a function? Well, whatever you put a function call in your Julia code, uh, that means that it has to do this if debugging check each time. So if this is a tight loop or performance sensitive loop, um, you don't want to put it in there because it can affect your code. So what's nice with macros is because this code is put in there before the code is compiled if so it's going to put in this code and it will take the message and interpolate it into this quoted code here and if debugging isn't turned off it's the macro is just going to produce nothing so when the compiler later comes and compiles after the macro has done its work then it's not going to turn into any code so there's no performance overhead for using a macro like this so you can freely put your debugging and just keep it there in your code so for a slightly more advanced one uh, in this case we're taking the line number in so we can keep track of where the debugging is happening and we're storing uh, that in here using interpolation and with the underscore underscore file we actually get the file name where the code is executing uh, or rather we get the path so we're using base name to just strip out the rest of the path and only get the file name it's a little bit unfortunate the way Julia works at the moment that we can't use the same approach for a line number. If we did use the underscore underscore line number, it's going to give us a line number for where the macro is defined, which is not what we want. So let's look at what this would look like in our bubble sort. So we added this line in here, which shows what's going on each time we do a swap. And you can see we put this underscore underscore a line in here which gives us the line number and hopefully in future versions of julia we're not going to have to put that in ourselves we can put it in the macro instead so let's start up julia again with our bubble sort code and uh looking at excess it's sort in the wrong way um and now if we run bubble sort you can see that we get all these debug messages or we can inspect excess and see how the X bubbles upwards or how the five bubbles upwards. So this allows us to see whether something funny is happening in the swapping or the sorting uh, going on there. So how will we debug with the REPL? That's the, the next thing to look at. So basically the most simple approach, and I've done that a lot, is just copy paste code one by one or line by line or chunk by chunk into the REPL environments. This is especially nice or easy to do with a more advanced editor like Atom, where you can evaluate individual lines in the editor itself. So you don't have to do this copy pasting. So I'm going to show you how to do that. First, you want to click the run to run to start up Julia and, and run your file and, and, and get your function definitions and variables into Julia. And then we're going to show the console because it's useful for inspecting variables and changing things. So we're looking at excess, seeing that it's uh, not sorted at the moment. 
And then the next thing we do is we mark off the lines that we want to evaluate. So this is the first lines that would run. You can see that we have length requires excess, but we have already defined excess. So we have something that's the sort of mimics the input. So you would have to set the input explicitly yourself. And then um, we don't evaluate the whole while loop because we actually uh, want to step into it essentially. So that's where we evaluate just the, the first line here, the swap equals false. And now to go into the for loop, uh, first we have to set i equals one in the console here. And then we mark off uh, the statement and evaluate it. So that is it's going to be just the same as if the code ran to this point and did the excess i larger than excess i plus one comparison. So going, uh, we can look at excess now and you can see that the x has moved up one place through the swapping. And next we set the i to two to, to continue the next iteration and when we mark off the lines again and we hit command enter which is going to evaluate these lines and so we can keep on going like that to basically step through the code now we do actually have some alternatives which is using the gallium editor so Keno Fisher has done a great job with this debugger um, you should look at some of his uh, talks on this um, it's, um, it's very impressive what you can do with it so I'm going to do a really, really uh, shallow uh, coverage of how this debugger works. It has uh, various commands, a lot more than I'm going to show you here. So n is a normal thing you probably use it from any kind of debugger. It's just stepping one line at a time, and you s is for stepping into a function call. And then nc uh, is cool because it allows you to evaluate one expression at a time. So you can evaluate, you can do nc multiple times on one line, and then edit. Really handy. Just Type out edit and it shows you um, the line you are uh, in the source code in your the editor you have configured for Julia. FR stands for frame, I believe. It shows you all the variables in the scope and their value. So let's just try this out. We're going to run Julia. Uh, if you haven't already installed Gallium, we have to do that with package add. I already have it, so that's why it says nothing to be done. And then you have to write using Gallium to get um, the Gallium functions in there. Well, the first time is probably going to run for a while to actually pre-compile uh, Gallium. So looking at XS, uh, not sorted. And we, of course, we can sort it with bubble sort. But we want to actually step through it. So we use this at enter macro from Gallium to step into bubble sort. And highlighted in yellow here is the line where the debugger is starting at. And the last line here says about to run, which means that copy and not bubble sort exclamation mark is going to be the first thing that's to run. And we can actually see what the arguments or the to copy is. So rather than just showing excess, it shows the content of excess, which is really handy when you're stepping through your code. So we're going to run nc for um, next call, which means we're just executing copy. And then it says the next thing it's uh, ready to run is the actual the bubble sort itself. Just to make sure to check where we actually are, we can just write edit, and it's going to pop up our editor and highlight the line we are at. Okay, so let's just continue. We'll use s to step into um, the bubble sort because we want to see what's going on there. Uh, and we come to the second line where we're assigning um, the length of excess to n, or that's that's the next um, line to run or expression. And then we're just going to st uh, step one line at a time with n. And you might want to look at what are the individual variables. So we write fr v, and you can see excess and n is what you expect i we haven't actually entered the for loop so that's why i is undefined at this moment so you have to 
type n to step into the R for loop. And then you can see that about to run says minus or six minus one. So it looks, uh, you see that it has been desugared uh, the minus operator. If you remember from earlier, when we looked at the different phases of how Julia code is compiled, basically the minus and the plus and all these mathematical operations are really just functions in Julia. So that's why it looks like this. So in our for loop, uh, we're going up to n minus 1. So that's uh, 6 minus 1. So that's why you see that's the next expression to call. Of course, Julie can't know whether we're going to just do one expression or one line. So um, when we hit an n here, we're going to do multiple expressions or function calls before it shows us the next one. And it shows us that the next one is going to be the get index function. And that's the desugared version of the square brackets index accessor. So if you remember when we implemented this ourselves for a, our own vector, uh, we had to implement the get index and set index to actually support these square brackets. So let's just keep on stepping. Um, we get a get index again because uh, when we're doing this swapping, we have to get the ith element of xs again. And of course, we're going to get the element of uh, i plus n. But we're only going to see that if we're running uh, the nc, but we're going to run n. So, um, But instead of looking at that, we're going to just show you what the frame looks like now. Now you can see that the i has been set to 1. But one thing that I really liked, and I probably use more than this frame thing, is to just hit the back ticks button, and that gives us a regular Julia REPL. The difference is that it has as environments um, everything set where we are in the code. So if I hit I, it shows the value of I. And I can inspect any variable and see um, XS. And I can write any kind of expression so I can compare whether uh, if I'm doing a comparison between these uh, elements in the excess, uh, whether those are true. So let me summarize. Uh, this went went through this quite quickly. So you really just got in a kind of a, um, a shallow introduction to debugging in Julia. It's a more complex subject. So we would have to cover that more in a more advanced course the details of it. But I think what's worth knowing is that uh, at the moment there are no traditional advanced visual debuggers in Julia and probably there won't be in a long time. I think for most script languages you typically don't have that or it typically takes some years before you get it uh, because they're not as dependent on those given that you have a sophisticated REPL environment. So macros and all these dynamic features in a REPL environment really makes up for a lot of that and makes it easier for us to create um, sophisticated loggers. Um, it makes it easy to evaluate lines manually and, and doing all sorts of things that can kind of compensate for the lack of that. And the really cool thing about the REPL, of course, is that it makes uh, a debugger like Gallium a lot more powerful. Uh, typically, in a static, in a debugger for a statically typed language, I can't really do all that much uh, while I'm stepping through the code. I certainly can't start writing um, any kind of code. Whereas in Gallium, I believe you could actually define your own functions while you're stepping. There's not really any uh, limits to that.